Hello folks, so we are now on salt marshes. First video this week, succession. Second video this week, sand dunes. Third video this week, salt marshes. Okay, so we're on page 35 of your module booklet. Remember where, just to give you a reminder of where we are in the module, Last week, you did some research for me about erosional and depositional landforms. Thank you very much. This week, we're still looking at coastal landforms, but they're the slightly more complicated ones. They require a little bit more explanation, so I am taking you through those instead. The fundamental concept for both sand dunes and salt marshes is something called succession. And I know I've said this many times, but just in case, this video will not make a lot of sense until you've got your head around succession. So please make sure you do this week's videos in order because otherwise you are going to be utterly confused about what's going on. Okay, page 35, salt marshes. We'll start with a photograph of what one looks like because um, sand dunes are reasonably obvious. People generally know what they look like, whereas salt marshes are a little bit more unfamiliar. Well, there is a salt marsh, ladies and gents. They are plants near the sea. Um, they're tidal, so you could that this was would be with the tide in, um, and when the tide was out, it would be much muddier than this. Okay, but this is how they start life, and it tells you this on page 35. Salt marshes start life as mud flats. And I just want to remind you about a few bits that we already know. Salt marshes are incredibly common in estuaries because estuaries are the mouths of rivers, where rivers meet the sea. Rivers bring more sediment to the coast than anything else. In fact, in most coastal systems, 80% um, of coastal sediment comes from rivers. All right, so that's really important. But the second thing, there is a process of deposition that happens in estuaries called flocculation. And I'm not gonna say what that is here today because I've been through it a couple of times. It's in coastal processes, and I did mention it in the succession video, but there's a process called flocculation, which is gonna be where quite a lot of that mud comes from. Okay, so that's a mud flat. It's flat and it's muddy and it's fairly self-explanatory. That is the, the first stage, if you like. You might notice these drainage channels. Um, there's a really lovely photo of drainage channels on page 35 as well. That's how the tide gets in and out. So yes, drainage channels are very much a feature of salt marshes, as I've written there, okay? The other thing I will just say, which is the text beneath the diagram on page 35, you're only going to get salt marshes in a very calm coastline. If your coastline is very high energy, it's very erosional, these are just going to get eroded away. All right, so this is all about calm, depositional. And in fact, one of the classic places to find a salt marsh is behind a spit because you've got absolutely perfect conditions. This, once again, ladies and gents, is Dawlish Warren. So we've got the River X bringing loads of sediment, loads of flocculation happening. The spit protects this bit, doesn't it? Because even if you've got really high energy erosion going on, the spit is going to absorb the brunt of that. And this is gonna be really calm and protected. So behind a spit is a sort of classic location for a salt marsh. Right, you're not getting deja vu, that is the same picture repeated. Um, so we're now talking about the stages of succession. Remember succession is a process whereby you start off with brand new land. Well let's think about it, that mud flat is brand new land. All right, so I used the example in the first video of a brand new volcanic island that has just appeared thanks to volcanic activity in the middle of the Pacific or the North Atlantic Ocean. This is the same basic principle. It's land that's been created by geographical processes that's got nothing living on it. And what will happen is the process of succession. 
So you'll end up with a whole stage, uh, sorry, a whole series of stages from nothing to a complete developed ecosystem. And if you look really carefully in this photo, you can kind of see. So we've got flat mud seemingly with nothing. We've got this little patch here, which is, has a greenish tinge. That's the beginning of some life happening. And then right at the back, we've got some much more developed vegetation. So we can kind of see some of the stages of succession in that photograph. Okay, as we know, the first plants that move in are called pioneer species because they have to be really tough. They have to cope with conditions that most other plants really wouldn't be able to. Now, uh, what you have here, uh, this is, let me get this right, this is glass wort, I think, or is that, oh no, it says Spartina. You, I'm not great at plants, <laughs> forgive me. Luckily, you won't need to be able to recognise them, so it doesn't matter. Um, as long as you know that you need the pioneer species as the first one, that will be fine. Now, exactly as we had with sand dunes, what the plants will do is they will encourage more deposition of sediment. So once you have your plants growing on sand dunes, they help trap more sand particles and enable your dunes to get bigger. Exactly the same principle with these. Once you've got these plants growing, you, they are going to encourage more deposition of mud. Now, the crucial thing with salt marsh is also distance in land, but I really want you to notice this, it's height or depth. Doesn't matter which of those words you use, one will make sense to some people and the other will make sense to others. All of this is mud flat, or I should say all of it started off as mud flat. But as time goes on and you get more plants, more mud gets trapped. And so the height of the marsh increases, or if you'd rather, the depth of the mud increases. So you can clearly see a significant difference between here and here in how high the mud is. Why is that significant? Because, ladies and gents, of tides. Tides are... Uh, the water coming in and out because of the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun. We've talked about them before. We've talked about spring high tides. Now, spring high tides are when the moon and the sun are working together. So you get really high, high tides. So you can see the spring high tide line there. That area, okay, from mean high tide to spring high tide, that is only going to be covered in water a couple of times a month. So it's not going to be underwater very often at all. Whereas anything between low tide and mean high tide is going to be underwater for about 12 hours and 25 minutes a day. That is a significant difference to how often this is going to be covered in salty water. And that's why You've got your pioneer species, your spartina, eelgrass, glasswork, whatever. That will only start to grow above the mean high tide line. It can just about cope with it, but really, that's going to be the start of your succession. That grass growing is going to trap more mud, and so the mud's going to get deeper and deeper. And once you get to the point where this mud is actually only going to be underwater during extreme storm conditions, you get your kind of pretty normal plants. That is a different version of the same basic principle. Some people find that a bit easier. Um, you've got a diagram on page 37, which some people like. Basically, I don't mind. It just needs to be either a diagram that makes sense to you or a series of uh, bullet points with words of what happens at each stage. I, I really don't mind. What this is trying to get across to you, so the low marsh is flooded every high tide, all right? Every high tide this is underwater. And uh, they're saying that you might get a bit of cord grass, but essentially not much. 
As soon as we get to high marsh, which is going to be under water at spring high tide, look, here are our pioneer species. But once we get into areas that are only going to be affected by the water in storms, you get a much greater variety of plants. There's a text version, <clears throat> if you're happier with text. Now, of course, you can pause this video at any point, copy the diagram, copy the text. There's a nice bit of space on page 37 uh, for you to add one or two diagrams or a diagram and some text, whatever it is you want to do. I have tried to write my own version from the bottom of page 35 over to page 36, uh, which you could just read through and highlight. It doesn't matter. But what I do find usually is that salt marshes cause a bit more head scratching than sand dunes for for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, but people do tend to find these a little bit trickier. All right. The thing I want you to remember, sorry, is it's the depth or the height of the mud, because that dictates how frequently it's underwater, and that dictates what can grow. So yet again, we are back to changing conditions. All right. That's always the important thing with a succession. As the conditions change, the plants will change. Okay, sorry, that is um, a very pretty fully developed salt marsh. So that's kind of uh, the end result, if you like. Uh, you can see uh, some high marsh here, and then you can see some proper trees and shrubs in the background. Uh, this website I will just show you is um, dictate, uh, sorry, directed at A-level students. So if I haven't done a particularly good job, for which I apologise, you could have a look on there. And then exactly the same as yesterday, um, explain why some places have salt marshes but some don't, etc, etc. I just want some prompts just for you to make sure that you can do the things that you need to be able to do. But have a Google. Uh, have a look on Time for Geography, ask me questions. I'm sure this is one of the parts of the coastal module that we are probably going to need to go over at some point. So no one is to stress, that's fine. Just to finish, um, a very quick nod to the future. At some point, we are going to be moving on to coastal management. And um, one of the modern forms of coastal management, which is now not so much about using millions of tons of concrete but actually trying to work with nature one of the modern forms of management is creating or should i say recreating salt marsh um, in the bad old days we used to try and get rid of salt marshes we used to turn them into farmland we used to destroy them um, we didn't we weren't very clever and now we've realised that they're actually amazing wildlife habitats and they can help us fight erosion. So um, this is happening in Somerset, as you can see. And uh, if you click, it's this photograph, um, then the hyperlink should hopefully work. Uh, no need to do any uh, work on that particularly at the moment. It's just, just interesting that we spent sort of a couple of decades trying as best as we can to get rid of salt marshes and now we're trying as much as we can to do the exact opposite it's just it's the beauty of humans at least we learn i suppose at least we learn okay so that's probably the hardest bit of this week uh, please get in touch if you've got any questions <laughs>